Before getting started, I wanna say a few words about PIA and give you some context on why we are hosting this webinar today. PIA is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that represents the Iranian American community before US policymakers and the American public at large. We work to enhance Iranian American participation in the American civic process, educate policymakers about the Iranian American community, and advocate for policies that would benefit the community and the country as a whole. For those of you who are familiar with our work, you know that we always strive to advocate for policies in a bipartisan manner. Chairman Jim Himes, Congresswoman Stephanie Bice have been great allies for us on Capitol Hill and have been working with us on bipartisan legislation from the Nauru's resolution to the Temporary Family Visitation Act. When we heard that they are also serving together on the Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth, we thought it would be very informative for our members uh, to learn about this issue and the important work they are doing on the committee. You know, inequality is not a Democratic or a Republican problem. It is an American problem, challenging our nation and requiring bipartisan cooperation. Great wealth disparities not only slow our economy, but also poison our politics, creating divisions and eroding our confidence in each other. I think we can all agree that as Americans, the health and well being of our country is worth learning about and participating in to help find solutions. Towards this end, we are delighted to have Hadi Partobi with us this afternoon to brief. Chairman Himes, Congresswoman Vice, and all of us on the work that his nonprofit, Code.org, is doing to help close the economic disparity gap. With all this said, I'm delighted to introduce you to my good friend and moderator, Councilman Amir Farrokhi. Amir is a lifelong Atlantan serving in a second term on Atlanta City Council. He has built a reputation as a thoughtful, pragmatic leader focused on policies over politics. Throughout his career, he's been committed to community engagement and has worked to make Atlanta a safer, more livable, and more vibrant city. Amir, my friend, the floor is yours. Thank you, Morad, uh, for the kind introduction. And it's good to be with everyone today. I hope wherever you are uh, in DC or around the country, you're taking care of yourself and staying healthy. We have a, a fantastic conversation today on uh, a pressing and, and vexing issue, which is the um, increasing and at times persistent economic disparity uh, and challenges in, in kind of closing that disparity gap uh, that we have in our country. And we have a, a top flight panel uh, to have that discussion today. Some quick housekeeping. Uh, we'll spend about 30 or so minutes uh, in panel discussion uh, with Congressman Himes, uh, Congresswoman Bice and Hadi uh, and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A from all of you who are watching today. If you have a question, feel free to drop it in the Q&A box, box, excuse me, box at any time. Uh, there may be one that strikes you in the moment, go ahead and put it in there uh, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. If it's appropriate to ask it in the flow of the panel, I'll do so. Otherwise, we'll ask uh, your questions once we get past some general panel discussion. Um, for both the panelists and all of us on the, on the webinar today, this is on the record, it will be posted, the recording of this will be posted on Pia's website uh, at some point in the coming days. So uh, not that any of you would speak otherwise, but uh, just keep that in mind as we go through the panel today. Um, I am uh, very much interested in this conversation. I, I live it here in Atlanta. Uh, we have the, uh, the largest wealth gap between black and white in the country. Uh, we have the second lowest economic mobility rate of any city in the country. We, uh, if you're born poor in Atlanta, you stand a 96% chance of uh, never making it to the top economic quintile in this city. Uh, and there's a whole host of reasons uh, behind that. that um, we fill a whole nother webinar, but um, excited that uh, Congressman Hines, Chairman Himes, and Congressman Bice have uh, led the way along with some of their colleagues to dive into this issue uh, in the House. And um, uh, looking forward to, to how we talk about a harsh reality in this country, which is it's just harder and harder to make it in America, no matter how hard you work. Inflation is outpacing wages. Uh, how do we how do we provide uh, a stable and, and um, uh, decent life for all Americans, no matter where you live? Um, so three panelists today: uh, Congressman Jim Hines, Democrat, uh, representing the fourth district, uh, congressional district in Connecticut. He served in 
in the House since 2009. He's chair, as uh, has been mentioned, of the Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. He also sits on the National Security, International Development and Monetary Policy Subcommittee of the House Financial Services Committee. It's a, a mouthful, I need an acronym there. And uh, fellow Iranian Americans, Congresswoman Stephanie Weiss, Republican of Oklahoma. She was recently elected in 2021 uh, and represents the 5th Congressional District in Oklahoma, which includes Oklahoma City and surrounds. She sits on uh, not only the Select Committee, but also on the Armed Services Committee and the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And of course, Hadi, who uh, Morad mentioned at the top, uh, CEO of Code.org, which he co-founded with his brother. Um, but that, had, that uh, has followed on the tail of an illustrious career in the, the tech industry as an engineer, as a tech exec, and uh, as a, a leading advisor and investor to some of um, America's largest and most innovative tech companies. So really a, a great A, a list um, panel today and excited for the conversation. Times, I'd like to start with you as chair of the, the committee. I'm gonna read very quickly uh, a snippet from the website of the committee. Um, it's a bipartisan committee formed to tackle a problem that has been generations in the making, as I know you have discussed uh, in some of your hearings and the conversations you've had. Uh, and it's, the website reads, quote, the yawning prosperity gap between wealthy Americans and everyone else. America is more unequal today than it has ever been and far more unequal than other developed nations. Can you talk a little bit about why this issue is important to you and maybe give us a quick overview on the work the committee has taken on so far? Yeah, thanks, Amir, and 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 a big thanks to Paya. I'm just I'm thrilled to be with uh, Congresswoman Vice uh, to join you for this conversation, and thanks for what you do as an organization. Um, I've had some contact with Paya over time, and it's um, uh, really a fabulous organization. Um, so to jump right into your your question, Amir, um, you, you know this is uh, economic disparity is an is an issue for all of us. We 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 may not, especially those of us maybe who have been very fortunate in life, may not feel that every single day. But it's an issue for all of us. I mean, it's a moral issue, right? I mean, um, there's a lot of ways you can articulate the moral side of things, but you know, great affluence right next to great poverty provokes some moral questions. Um, probably, regardless of your value set or your or your faith. Uh, it provokes um, some difficult questions. Um, it, it's an economic issue. Um, you know, more and more economists are coming to realize that dramatic economic disparity actually reduces the size of the pie for everybody. Um, that aggregate um, productivity is damaged if you've got a vast number of Americans who are less productive than they might be, who find it hard to get a job, who don't have the money to invest, that sort of thing. Um, and what's intriguing about it, what's intriguing about the the, the question of bipartisanship is it, it is it is not an issue that is concentrated in red or blue America. Um, and therefore, um, I think it's a, a subject for really interesting conversation. And let me try to be very brief in this. But, you know, the reality is that in the world in which Stephanie and I live, there's an awful lot of nonsense. Um, you know, we have to draw a contrast with the other party. And, you know, there's a lot of nonsense. I've been here for a while. and There's a lot of nonsense. The reality is um, that the single biggest factor which drives prosperity in human history is a free market. Um, that's what's lifted a billion Chinese out of poverty, a billion Indians. That's what created the prosperity of, uh, of the West. Um, that might be a, a, a point of view that is more typical of the right of the Republican Party. The other reality, of course, is that the market doesn't solve all equity problems. Uh, you know, markets quickly devolve into monopolies or oligopolies. And what we've discovered over a couple hundred years in this country is that some combination of the free market driving prosperity with good interventions, and that intervention might be Social Security, which lifted, you know, retirees out of poverty. It might be um, an intervention in healthcare. That, that's how you build a system of prosperity. Um, and so the really interesting question is, where are the lines? And that's, of course, where Republicans and Democrats disagree. And the last thing I want to say on this topic is, is um, I tell young people who come to the Capitol, it hasn't happened a lot in the COVID era, but I tell high schoolers who come visit me, different points of view are a dramatic asset for this country. Um, you know, and hopefully you'll hear Stephanie and I agree on a lot of things and disagree on some things, because it is in that disagreement that we get sharper and smarter and we craft solutions that are better. Um, I sometimes tell those high school students, you can go live in a place where there are political arguments. You don't want to. You don't, you know, you do not want to do that because those places are North Korea and uh, I, I, I won't go on. But um, and um, and, you know, so we need to find a way 
to recapture the notion that those disagreements are a core strength of our country. And a lot of that depends on us um, approaching things a little differently with, with some grace, with some humility, with some openness, which is a ethic I've tried to instill in the committee. Look, Nancy Pelosi asked me to chair this committee. I'm a former investment banker that comes from Fairfield County, Connecticut. She did not need to ask me to do this. My district is very purple, but the fact that she asked me to do this suggests that she envisioned, and she matters because she's the Speaker of the House, this as the kind of committee that I'm talking about right now, rather than yet another platform for us to scream at each other. Well, I'm gonna come back to something you mentioned. I'm gonna plant this seed now, but you think about the answer you mentioned, the, the power of disagreement, how it's reflective of a healthy uh, democratic and uh, probably thriving society. Um, I, I will ask you in a second, uh, what bipartisan uh, shared interests have you found on the committee? Where have you seen ideas brought before the committee that you see bipartisan curiosity or, or open-mindedness around, around? I'll come back to you on that in a minute. And uh, Congressman Bice, you're welcome to answer that as well. But I was gonna ask you, uh, coming from uh, your district in Oklahoma, uh, why this committee for you? What what why, what leads you to be on it? And uh, what have you found most interesting so far? Well, first of all, I want to say, uh, Amir, thank you to Paya for putting this together. Uh, it's a joy to work with uh, Congressman Himes on this committee. And uh, Hattie, it's great to see you and meet you in person. So thank you for, uh, for letting me be a part of today. You know, <clears throat> I was asked to be a part of it. I think, um, you know, I bring maybe a new fresh perspective on a couple of different fronts. Uh, I'm a freshman, so I'm new to Congress, and I have that perspective of having been in um, the business world for um, 20 plus years and then having been in the state legislature for the last six. I bring a little bit of a different perspective because I've seen, um, you know, kind of on boots on the ground aspects of what happens um, in my community. And the second thing is, uh, and we've seen this on the committee, we all come from different walks of life. As Jim mentioned, he has a background in financial services. Uh, one of our members um, is the gr uh, granddaughter of a telecom uh, founder. Um, I came, uh, I am the product of an immigrant father who came to this country for a better life. Um, my parents were divorced when I was young. Um, it was a very uh, difficult um, childhood because we didn't have resources. We didn't have, um, you know, uh, uh, we had a, a home, but um, not a lot of food on the table. Uh, and so I come at it from the perspective of um, having to pull myself up from my bootstraps and be able to put myself through college um, and kind of find chart my own path. And so I think that that diversity of thought is incredibly important. But there are some things that we all can see and recognize. Um, that is inflation is impacting, um, you know, every uh, American and certainly in Oklahoma. Um, there are certain aspects of cost of living. What's happening in Oklahoma, um, you know, although it may increase the, um, we've, we've seen an increase in homelessness in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City particularly, um, it's more prevalent in big cities like San Diego because the cost of living is so significant. So part of the, com the uh, committee's responsibility is really to think through, first of all, what is economic um, prosperity? What does diversity um, look like? And then secondly, how do we sort of find a way to bridge the gap in some ways? And that's been our focus and our goal. Certainly the committee is fairly young, I would say. Uh, we've only had a handful of um, committee hearings so far. But I think as we get further along down the path, um, we'll have, we've had some really robust conversations around that, but we'll continue to kind of flesh out where are the agreements and where are the disagreements, whether it is um, you know, on, on education, whether it is on financial services and um, sector issues, housing issues, we all recognize there are problems. And I think we have to figure out how do we come together to solve some of those. And certainly they're not something that we can solve every one of, but we can find some ways to make an impact. Terrific, thank you. So from both of you, I hear a lot of uh, bipartisan problem-solving energy. Uh, we'll come back to, to the possibilities there in a moment. I wanna bring in Hadi, uh, who has done some remarkable work with Code.org to talk a little bit about what Code.org Code does, obviously, but um, where he sees opportunity uh, from the computer science perspective and skill building to help close uh, income disparity gaps, particularly for women and, and people of color. Hadi? Thanks so much, and it's an honor to be here, and thanks for hosting me. Uh, you know, my personal story is different than most folks. Uh, 
but I think at the same time, there's a bit that I share with everybody. Uh, like, you know, for many uh, Iranians in the audience, my, my story is I came to the United States in 1984, but I had grown up initially in Iran as a child. So I lived through the revolution and the Iran-Iraq war when I was from ages six to 12. Uh, so I spent my childhood basically in a basement every night when we were getting bombed and walking around in a police state by day, worrying about whether my mom and dad were gonna get rushed off to prison for some arbitrary reason. Uh, and that part of my life is different than most Americans. But the part that's similar is after my family came to the United States as immigrants, we were poor. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't afford a home. We had to basically borrow a bedroom in somebody else's house for all four of us as a family to grow up as I, as I was growing up. And uh, what enabled me, unlike the folks that you mentioned uh, in, in Atlanta, where the chance of getting to the highest quintile of, of income is, is difficult, I made it from the bottom to the top because of my own background in computer science, which I learned thanks to a father who was a physicist and a mother who was a computer scientist. And they introduced me to coding and computer science when I was young. So I started code.org out of this belief that every school and every student should have the opportunity. Uh, you know, in our country, there's lots of disagreements about uh, questions about equality of outcomes and inequality of outcomes, but every American believes fundamentally in equality of opportunity. And the problem that code.org tries to solve is that right now, access to computer science in schools is very unequal. And even among schools that offer it, participation is unequal. Uh, but the access problem is the most un-American thing because low-income neighborhoods don't offer computer science in their schools. And so what are the, why is it surprising that if you grow up in a poor neighborhood, you don't learn the skill that is most likely to get you into the highest paying jobs in the country. It's the most valued skill in our economy and you're not introduced to it until you get to college, if you even make it to college. Uh, that's the problem we're trying to solve. And what's great about this is that this is a very, bipartisan problem, uh, and it applies to every state. In every state, the income ability and the economic opportunity in computer science is massive. For example, in, in Connecticut, there's 75,000, sorry, 7,500 open jobs currently in computer science, but only 564 graduates last year. Or in Oklahoma, there's 4,500 currently open jobs, but only 500 graduates last year. And you'd think, well, which are the states that are exporting talent to fill these jobs? There's no states. Every state in the United States is importing tech talent. And in fact, it's the majority of our, two thirds of all of our high skilled immigration is just to fill the talent gap we have in this specific field of computer science. Of can all I, the can I? Sorry, go Sorry, ahead. Howdy. I was just actually gonna tack on because I think it's a fantastic point and I think, in addition to that, the challenge is also um, the ability for us to address rural community economic development and disparity, right? And when you're talking about coding, nobody's teaching that in rural Oklahoma, at least. And then you have the added layer of having um, access to broadband or not in many yeah. communities. And so that just sort of exacerbates this um, disparity that we talk about. Yeah. But what's great is the pandemic has actually changed the opportunity side of this. You know, if you asked which state in the country has the most open tech jobs, it's California with around 75,000 currently open jobs. If you ask who's number two, the number two state is remote, which means if you're a rural resident in Oklahoma, there's over 60,000 currently open jobs if you have the right skills, if you have the right education, whether you're in rural Oklahoma and rural Kentucky, urban Atlanta, you can work for Shopify, a Canadian company, or Spotify, a British company, or name any tech company. Almost every tech company has remote jobs now available that will hire people who don't need to have like a brain drain where they leave their, their region. They can bring a very high income job to their region. The, the missing piece is education in the schools. But the other really good thing is this is a very bipartisan issue. Computer science education is the only Obama era policy that Trump doubled down on and Biden also supports. Uh, and in fact, right now in Congress, there's an act that was, you know, the Senate version of the USICA Act and the uh, House version of the Competes Act both have provisions to, to fund computer science education. Uh, if hopefully all the other issues going through Congress 
get those two to meet. Uh, we'll finally have the first time when there's actually federal funding for computer science uh, until we get there. Code.org is basically, I, I personally fundraise for this. So a huge part of my job is basically getting wealthy individuals to, to give funding for schools to begin teaching computer science. Uh, but ultimately it's the job of our government to, to, to help make that education piece. How do you, you uh, observe the opportunity that exists, but the, the skills gap that, that makes filling those opportunities difficult? What's the, what's preventing the scale uh, that we need here? Where, where's the, the obstacle or obstacles? Um, is it in curriculum in, in middle and high schools, the absence of computer science curriculum? Are there other, other obstacles that need to be removed so that this skill set uh, can be filled domestically and not necessarily all through that, immigration? That's a great question. The problem is definitely not curriculum. It used to be, uh, and when we started code.org, uh, if, if a school wanted to know how do I teach computer science, where do I go? The answer wasn't easy. Uh, We've made that answer easy at code.org and our curriculum is taught in roughly 60% of schools that teach computer science, but there's like many others who also offer free high quality curriculum, so, as do we. The, the problem is teachers themselves never learned computer science, so who's going to teach the class? And the funding that's necessary is for retraining America's teaching workforce to be able to get a math teacher, a biology teacher, a history teacher, even an art teacher to learn how to offer a computer science class. Uh, and we've now shown that that can be done. It's actually extremely cost effective. It costs a few thousand dollars of training to get one existing teacher to, to begin teaching computer science. And that one teacher can teach hundreds of kids. Uh, and basically, instead of trying to worry about reskilling our workforce after they graduate, we need to give them the right skills when they're still in K through 12. Uh, and, the, and the missing piece really is teachers. Uh, and the professional development and training of teachers is the thing that needs funding. Uh, and it's the thing that I'm bullish about that if, if the, the act that I was talking about in Congress passes, it actually, for the first time after almost 10 years working on this, uh, there's a potential bill in Congress to fund the training of new teachers in computer science. Excellent. So uh, one, one tool in the toolbox for the, the committee, the select committee, is this computer science education scaled around the country uh, and, and taught uh, aggressively. Uh, Congressman Himes, I want to return to you to the question that I posed uh, when I transitioned away from you the first time. Any um, areas of bipartisan agreement or, or kind of shared aha or curiosities that you've seen amongst the committee so far? And I know, obviously, you've had folks testify before the committee. You've gone out around the country and talked to folks. Uh, what has surprised you or kind of caught you most in those uh, in, in that testimony or those conversations? Well, it, it has been gratifying um, so far. Um, we, we, we started out on the wrong foot. You know, the committee got caught up in the mess um, associated with the January 6th select committee, right, which, of course, is is ground zero for partisanship. Um, and when Speaker Pelosi wouldn't seat two members of the January 6th committee, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, Leader McCarthy said, well, I'm not naming Republicans. And so we, we, we got hung up for about four months. So we were, we were kind of victims um, of some pretty intense partisanship right up front. But since then, um, I would tell you, it's been surprising the extent to which the conversations on the committee formally and informally have really been constructive. Um, you know, somewhere here, and I'm not sharing it publicly because it'll embarrass too many people, but somewhere, somewhere here, I've got a wonderful photograph of um, Warren Davidson of Ohio, who's a libertarian Republican. I mean, I really like the guy. We don't agree on much, but, a really, but I really like the guy. Hardcore, uh, principled libertarian deeply engrossed in a conversation with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I took the picture, which I'm not sharing publicly, just because I thought this is success. If these two people can have a conversation, well, we're doing something right. Um, and so uh, it has been, and, and, you know, hey, we've got, you know, uh, partisanship in Congress is a strange beast, right? It's sort of like the weather, it changes. And we're in, we're in really ugly weather right now. We have been for some period of time. And as we approach the election uh, in November of 22, where the Republicans have a reasonable chance of taking a majority of the House and the Senate, it's gonna be harder for them to, you know, to reach across the aisle because they'll be driving contrast. And by the way, we do things on the Democratic side, like the bill that uh, Hadi was talking about. It's a spectacular bill. Um, 
shame on the Democrats for uh, for uh, loading it up with some things that make it hard for the Republicans to support it. Um, and shame on the Republicans for not looking past that and saying, all right, we don't like this whole thing, but it'll get out, it'll get hammered out in Congress. Um, so both sides bear some blame for what you're about to see with the, with that with that bill. But um, uh, there, there's a couple of areas in addition, because Hadi's exactly right, training, workforce development, um, more resources to bring more people into the STEM fields, I think is going to be an area of agreement. Um, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would highlight a couple of others. Infrastructure, and I know whereof I speak, right, because we just passed a very, very significant infrastructure bill, which was very strongly bipartisan in the Senate and, and a little less strongly bipartisan in the House, which, by the way, is one of the, th one of the parts of the weather that, for a bunch of reasons, the House tends to be more partisan than the Senate. But uh, infrastructure, and you know, that's a word that sounds boring, but one of the prime drivers of, of a lack of economic opportunity and therefore disparity is populations that are isolated, that can't get to either the networks or to the ports or to the, you know, Austin, Texas of the, or San Francisco or Boston or whatever it may be. Um, uh, so infrastructure is really important here. And, and I do think it's bipartisan. Um, I'll throw, it came up, it came up. So I'll throw it out in a careful way. Um, Immigration. Um, it, I say in a careful way because immigration in some ways is at the very core of the anger um, of the last, let's say, five years. Um, and I'll, I, I try to talk these things in, in a way that doesn't entirely get viewed through partisan lens, but I think we'd all agree that Donald Trump had very, <laughs> what I would call, both untenable and unappealing views of immigration. And I get it, I get it. He was focused on certain kinds of immigrants and he was focused on the border, I get it. But my point is that writ large, that issue is about as toxic as it gets. But inside that toxic issue is, I think, absolute bipartisan agreement that we ought to be doing an awful lot more to keep the you know hundreds of thousands of graduate students who come from all over the world to study in the very best universities in the world that we ought to keep them here. We ought to make it easy for them to stay. I mean, I won't run the, uh, I, I wish I had a little note card with all the spectacular businesses that Iranian Americans have started, but you know, name a world beating company in this, in this country. And it is quite likely that it is either run or was founded by a fairly recent immigrant. So in a careful way, I would offer up immigration as in a, in a, in a careful and limited way, absolutely bipartisan, even if the larger topic is in some ways the most toxic topic that we talk about here. I think what you just articulated, Congressman, is, is really the, the breadth of uh, issues that this topic, uh, you know, addresses. I mean, there is not a, um, a public policy bucket in in your uh, on your agenda that, frankly, doesn't touch on economic and security, economic mobility. I think we've gone from computer science to infrastructure. You know, there's all types of innovative work going around, cash transfers and. Uh, guaranteed income. There's uh, home ownership programs. There's a wide uh, number of arrows in the figurative quiver. I'm curious, Congresswoman Bice, um, whether from your perspective, representing a fairly diverse district in Oklahoma, or just your own kind of personal public policy interests, are, are there solutions that you think are most uh, most important to this to this challenge, or are there certain solutions that have caught your eye? Say, I'd like to learn more about this. You know, I think we're really diving into some of those things right now, but one thing I think that we should be talking about um, is workforce and education and how he kind of brought that up and what he's, um, you know, working on. <clears throat> I think, you know, I have two children myself, my husband and I have two daughters, um, 20 and 17. And I, I sort of blame our generation for perpetuating the idea that you have to go to college to be successful right? We have to get out of that mindset. And I think that we can all agree from a bipartisan perspective that over the years we pushed college, um, you know, the schools were pushing it, our college counselors were pushing it. Um, but the reality is that, you know, you can engage with Hottie and code.org, um, learn how to code. You don't need to call it a four-year degree to, to become proficient and successful at it and go out and make really great money. In addition to that, uh, and, and so I think part of that is we have to sort of pivot or change the mindset of my generation, you know, the, the 40 to 60 generation to say, look, if college isn't your thing, let's look at another path. Let's look at 
career tech, community college, programs like code.org. These all provide incredible opportunities. And one of the things that we are looking at facing right now from a workforce standpoint is a shortage of the trades. So when you're looking at plumbing, electrical, welding, um, HVAC, people sort of think, well, those are hands on, you know, blue collar work type things. But the reality is, I don't know, Amir or Hadi or, or Jim, if you all have called a plumber or an electrician in the last few months, but man, they're making bank. I mean, it is expensive. And so why are we not highlighting the fact that a young person can spend a year um, as a journeyman or an apprentice in an apprenticeship program and get out and start their own small business and become you know, a business owner and dictate their own hours and be able to hire more people to you know, um, be part of their organization. These are the sorts of things that we really should be talking about. And I don't know that we've done a great job of that. We also talk a lot about the education front and certainly Hadi uh, brought up the idea that we don't have enough teachers. That's exactly right. Oklahoma has battled that for quite some time. We gave our teachers a significant pay raise when I was in the state legislature, but the reality is we're not turning out enough teachers to fill that workforce gap. So not only are we not doing it on the engineering front, but we're not training teachers. So I think that part of our job as Congress may be to look at education from a completely different perspective. How do we make sure that young people are um, prepared for the future in whatever that way that looks like? I read a great book a while back. It's called The Second Machine Age, and it talked about economic disparity and how in some ways um, the advancement of technology is actually perpetuating that. It was very fascinating to see that perspective. Um, but I think there's ways to address it that um, we should be, um, you know, looking at and trying to engage with. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Bice. I mean, you bring up a really uh, fair and interesting point, which is, uh, I think, the opportunities that exist in, in traditional trades, right? And even those trades today are increasingly tech oriented or focused, you may have to, uh, you're using a, a machine or a device that didn't exist uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And oftentimes your job is to be able to repair that machine or code that machine uh, alongside any traditional blue collar or hands-on labor that may exist in your role, whether that's auto manufacturing or the plumber who comes to your house and sticks some device down a, on a clogged uh, drain. I mean, it, 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 there's an interface here that um, is front and center. And I, Hadi, I want to turn to you. You mentioned um, that the, the bill before Congress um, that is to be voted on or to be hopefully to be passed um, requires states to develop plans to address equity gaps in computer science enrollment. Can you talk a little bit about what those gaps are? Are they gender gaps? Are they race gaps? Uh, I assume there's some income gaps. You know, where, where are the gaps in computer science um, enrollment? Sure. Uh, before I answer your question, I had two comments I wanted to make about uh, things that both uh, Congressman Hines and, and Congressman Vice said. Um, with respect to Congresswoman Bice, I totally agree with the stuff you were saying in terms of rethinking education or this mindset that you have to go to college uh, in order to get a job, which really wasn't a thing 100 years ago. And in many other countries, if you go to Germany, this mindset that you can only get hired in a good job if you went to college simply doesn't exist. Uh, and it's really hurting our country that employers are looking only for college degrees and schools think that, you know, even if you took it, if, so anyway, I support your idea of rethinking education. And when we do that, I think it's super important when looking at K-12 to reconsider what we are teaching kids so that when they graduate, they have the skills. I so regularly hear from people who are like, like happy that we're teaching computer science and then are saying, why aren't we also teaching financial literacy, how to do your taxes, what a mortgage means, basic civic engagement, things like that. And instead we're teaching a list of stuff that is no longer relevant. And I don't wanna be the one naming that list of stuff, but every parent experiences it when their kid asks, why am I learning blah, blah, blah in school? Uh, I, and so I, had a, I had a senior ask me recently, why am I taking chemistry? I am not going to do anything related to chemistry right. whatsoever. So yes, I agree with you there. <laughs> And the, the comment I wanted to make to Congressman Hines is basically part of the messaging that code.org, we're called code.org, but we're about computer science. Um, and it's important to name computer science separately from STEM because uh, the majority, two thirds of STEM jobs 
are just in computer science. It's almost all of STEM jobs are computer science jobs. Two thirds of H-1B visas are for computer scientists. But where you look at where the money goes or what the students are studying, it's 95% not computer science. The majority of STEM graduates are in social sciences, behavioral sciences, things that are important, but they're not, when you, when you think STEM, the studying isn't being done where the employment opportunities are. Uh, and that's why a focus on computer science hones that in. Uh, and now to the question you asked me about uh, inequities, uh, the biggest inequity in computer science is access, meaning your school doesn't even offer it. And that is directly linked to income and geography. Uh, rural schools, low income schools, and schools with a higher representation of black and Latino or native students, tribal schools, those are the ones that don't have access. And in fact, access to computer science is directly correlated to income. Uh, the wealthiest schools, the majority of the wealthy schools offer computer science, and in the lowest income neighborhoods, less than half of schools offer it. Uh, the, the other inequities end up happening based more on social stereotypes of what people believe a computer scientist can be and school kind of training you and media training you that unless you're a white or Asian teenage boy, this isn't for you. Or if you're not nerdy or geeky and not going to spend your whole life in a basement with you know, drinking energy drinks in the dark with a Star Wars poster on the wall. Like, if that's not your life, then you shouldn't do computer science. And these, I don't know if I'd call that an inequity, but it's a major stereotype we need to change. And we've now shown that seven-year-old girls, nine-year-olds, black, brown, what you name it, any, any background can learn and can ex excel. And one of the most interesting things we've learned, uh, we now have eight years worth of data from tens of millions of students in computer science classes. One of the most interesting things is the group that feels like they least belong in computer science is young women. Their belonging is even lower than Black or Latino students who are also underrepresented in the field. But if we look at who's doing well at the actual in-classroom assignments, the, the women are outperforming uh, the, the young men. And just sharing that data back to teachers to let them know that you're your girls are outperforming the boys in computer science, but they're not enrolling in it. They think this isn't for me. Uh, that's a major inequity we need to we need to address, and a lot of that comes to messaging and role models and things like that. For those underrepresented groups, whether it's girls or uh, black and brown young young men and women, are there career paths they don't uh, recognize that computer science leads them to, or are there role models that you see them the light bulb go off over their head that really triggers? their sense of belonging in the space? Yeah, I mean, we regularly promote role models in this space, whether it's celebrities who also studied computer science, like Chris Bosch, the basketball player, uh, or, uh, you know, there's, there's many of these that, that I can name. Draymond Green from the, from, uh, from the Warriors also uh, studied JavaScript when he was in high school. And we make sure that students know about these. Uh, but, the, the role of a teacher or a parent or a counselor are even more important. Um, and that said, professional development of teachers can help with that as well. Uh, you know, it takes a whole village to, to change stereotypes and societal ones. But the hardest problem still is access. Whether you're black, brown, white, or Asian, if your school doesn't even offer it, that's, you're just not gonna get involved. And that's the thing that needs teacher training and funding for the teacher training. That's, that's the hardest problem of all. Thank you. I, I saw one chat in the Q&A or one question in the Q&A box. I also looked at the list of participants. I know a number of you. You're brilliant, smart, uh, thoughtful people. So I know there's questions lurking. Uh, so please drop your question in the Q&A box. Going back to Congressman Himes, um, I'm curious what success looks like uh, from your perspective for the select committee. And if at some point there will be recommendations made by the committee. Yeah, great question. Um, that was, <laughs> was probably the first question I asked myself. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think success looks like um, the ability to, uh, do, to do two or three things. Number one, to highlight some things that are working out there. Um, and by the way, it need not be government programs. Um, I sometimes uh, kid my fellow Democrats that um, 
the federal government has been incapable of passing a $15 minimum wage, but uh, nationally, but Amazon did a $15 minimum wage nationally, right? Um, and so, and you know, in this highly politicized environment that is not necessarily well received uh, amongst my colleagues, but it, it, it demonstrates the fact that um, that you know the private sector, the philanthropic sector, others are actually doing some pretty remarkable things in this area, and we should highlight what those are for the purpose of trying to drive scale. Um, you know, uh, there are incredible programs that are working in cities and towns and suburbs and rural areas around this country, and one of the things we can do is provide a platform to demonstrate and to highlight those things. Number two, um, in the spirit of bipartisanship, the reality is that regardless of what happens in the next couple of years in terms of who controls what chamber, as we continue to see, unless you have bipartisan support in the Senate, you don't make law, generally speaking. And so for that reason, I do hope that we can, uh, at the end of this, say, look, here's 10 legislative ideas. They're not huge ideas because you know that may be overly ambitious, but here's 10 legislative ideas that this committee is willing to say could draw bipartisan support because it has bipartisan support in the committee. That's the objective of sort of trying to create this environment in which people set aside, you know, take off their armor and put down their weapons and maybe lean into uh, 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 some ideas that could be um, bipartisan. And then finally, um, we haven't talked about this yet, but we're um, the very first hearing we did was in Lorain, Ohio. Um, this is a uh, problem that is everywhere in America. So we're going to do more travel. Um, in two weeks or so, the committee and whatever members want to attend will be out in California and San Francisco, because here's a place where we've seen massive innovation and wealth creation. And first of all, what's the magic? Second of all, how do you make it possible for people who want to participate in that magic to actually live within 50 miles of the highest cost, you know, place on the planet? Um, uh, and, you know, we'll go to rural areas. Um, in order to make sure that we are seeing America in all of its richness, but also so that America kind of sees us because you know, an awful lot of Americans, including in my coastal district, you know, think that Washington doesn't understand what they do. And what better way to try to um, uh, increase the confidence in the overall system if we're actually out listening to real people. We start every hearing, by the way, um, I don't know, I haven't checked with Stephanie or my fellow members how they feel about this, but the first four minutes of every hearing is somebody who's just out there in America dealing with issues of race or dealing with issues of, uh, you know, the difficulty of starting a business, because we really do want to put front and center, not us, which believe me is a deeply uninstinctual thing for us, but put front and center, um, you know, American people in the places that they live. You mentioned, uh, which I think is a terrific way to approach uh, problem solving. It builds trust with an institution that, uh, that sometimes lacks trust, um, going out and talking to folks who may feel that the Beltway doesn't represent them, doesn't reflect their day-to-day -day lives. What have you heard? Uh, what would you hear in Ohio? Uh, what do you expect to, not, not to you know, kind of predispose what you'll hear, but what are some of the things you hope to hear or expect to hear as you go around the country? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, Ohio will probably be the day that really sticks with me. Um, Lorain, Ohio, we had a, a, a meeting with a bunch of community groups. So Lorain, Ohio is a town that used to have a massive, I mean, truly massive, I've never seen a plant this large, steel mill on the, on the lake there. Um, fairly typical story of the Midwest. Well, that steel mill closed down. Um, and so now you have a formerly enormously prosperous with a thriving middle-class town that is really struggling, really struggling. And this, this is a story all over America, right? Uh, other than a few locales where affluence is concentrated. Um, and to have those discussions in the shadow of this closed steel mill was really remarkable. And what was best about it, what was best about it is that there's something about getting us out of Washington and listening to people who are running community colleges in towns like Lorraine, we're trying to bring in development to towns like right. You know what they don't care about? They don't care about our partisan messaging. They're not much interested in it. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, we spend a lot of time drawing contrast, right? That's how you win elections. Drawing, they don't care about that. What they care about is what works and what doesn't work. So um, we're gonna do a lot more of that. And as I said, 
you know, what's been most remarkable to me so far has been listening. I have no idea, by the way, what the party registration was of the 30 or so people that we met and had dinner with and talked to and everything else. But what they were all about was don't don't give me your talking points. Let me tell you what works. And, and again, we're going to try to center that on this committee. Thank you, uh, Congressman. I'm, I'm looking at questions in the, the Q&A box. Uh, I see one that will stay on the committee for a second before I turn a couple of the others. Uh, and this one is uh, regarding kind of the programs that may benefit or target minority groups. Are there any programs or approaches that you've seen that target minority groups? And uh, would, would the committee, consider, this is a, a call with a lot of Iranian Americans, would the committee consider supporting programs that define Iranian Americans as a minority group? Something that uh, has eluded Iranian Americans despite our successes uh, over the, the last 40, 50 years. Well, I'd like to hear from Stephanie on this too. She may, she, I, I'd be interested in her perspective. Um, it's a, it's a little bit of a loaded question, right? In the sense that, so we just had a hearing on race, and I was very nervous about it because, you know, along with immigration, the topic of race um, is a tough one uh, always, uh, and it actually went really, really well. Uh, I was, I was really relieved. But one of the facts of this country is, you know. Uh, look at the Latin inscription on our on our coins out of many one, uh, you know, one of the facts of the Constitution of the United States is that we don't, we try really hard not to distinguish by race, right? And the history of the civil rights movement is largely African Americans um, saying, don't prejudice us in voting or in economic opportunities, and the country responding imperfectly, imperfectly, by saying we won't prejudice you in those negative ways. And that therefore makes it pretty hard. And we're, gonna, we're about to be treated, by the way, to a really interesting conversation around affirmative action in the Supreme Court. But my point is, um, it is extraordinarily hard for lawmakers to target um, government programs at particular ethnic or racial groups um, for very good reasons and for reasons that maybe are discouraging. You know, most notably of the, <laughs> of the huge bills that we've passed under two presidents to try to address the COVID um, emergency, $6 trillion in spending, um, a number of those programs were targeted, for example, at African-American farmers, uh, amongst whom there's just a terrible, terrible story of land confiscation and you name it. And the courts have pretty regularly turned those programs back because the courts say equality before the law. So anyway, um, I don't know that I have a good solution to offer. All I can tell you is that given the founding DNA of this country, that kind of thing is very, very challenging. Why I mentioned the thing I mentioned where inequality and in access to computer science is both by income and by race. So you could just target it by income and you would capture the racial inequity in it without needing to name a, a group. Uh, right, which is, which, is generally, which is generally what we've done. Um, that's a lot less controversial. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, uh, so sort of uh, tag on to what, what Hattie just said, I think that's the, tends to be the focus is trying to focus on uh, low income, whether it is um, housing, whether it is um, access to education, you know, those are the sorts of things that I think that you see more of a, um, a, a collaboration to be able to, to address those issues. But interestingly enough, you know, someone said to me a while back, um, the only two um, uh, groups that are not considered minorities are um, white men and Iranian Americans, sort of from a federal perspective. And I never thought about it that way, but it's true. Women are considered sort of a minority group. When you're talking about DBE designations or, or you know, that sort of thing, um, you can be a vet, you can be a woman, you can be African American, Pacific Island, or all of these things. But for some reason, Iranian American doesn't fit that, um, that designation. So it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it's something I've just- uh, Middle Easterners in general are not- Go ahead, Hadi, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say Middle Easterners in general are not counted on the US census. So there's not even a stat to know how many uh, right. exist in this country, let alone programs or anything to, to support them. Just counting them on the census differently than white would, uh, would be the first step. There's a question in the, uh, in the Q and A box uh, about the challenge that inflation and a likely interest rate increase poses to uh, entrepreneurs and small business owners. 
Uh, don't know if there's any reflections from our congressional members of the panel on how we balance uh, kind of stamping out inflation uh, with uh, making sure that small businesses feel like they have the ability to, to draw loans and get, get capital they need to, um, to succeed. Um, I've got some thoughts, but let me, let me let Stephanie go first. I actually feel like, Jim, you're going to be much better prepared for this answer, <laughs> given that that was your background than I would be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, we're kicking it back and forth. Um, uh, Look, inflation is a real problem um, for people. It's uh, it, you know it it it, it erodes people's savings. It, it it takes away people's raises, which is what we're seeing right now. Right, the American people have seen their wages increase, but they've also seen prices increase. So it's a real problem that actually hits um, the bottom half or the bottom third, however you want to think of it, of the of the income distribution the hardest. Um, the the prescription is difficult though, right? The medicine is difficult, right? Because the one tool, well, we have two tools. We have fiscal policy and, and monetary policy. And, you know, there's no question that spending $6 trillion, you know, and it was done in bipartisan fashion, $4 trillion of those $6 trillion was done under Donald Trump, roughly speaking. The other two was under, under President Biden. Um, when you spend that much money, you are going to create inflationary pressure. So, ooh, that's bad. But remember, compare our economic um, indicators to the UK, to Germany, to Switzerland, to other countries that we sort of consider peer countries, and you'll see that our recovery has been much faster. And again, that's not a partisan point. Started under Donald Trump. But, but you know, Good news, bad news. Our economy has been has come back much, much more rapidly than our peer countries. But yes, we were dealing with inflationary pressures. The medicine is going to be tough, right? I mean, um, we're uh, uh, not likely to see dramatic contractions in government spending. Um, and here, you know, newsflash, neither party wants contractions in spending. <laughs> they say they do, right? The Democrats say they want to spend a little less on defense, but they want to spend more. No, but look, look at the last, look at the last six presidents of both parties. Nobody, no dirty little streak into Washington, nobody's for less spending. So it's not likely to happen. Um, so therefore the Fed is going to raise interest rates, which is going to, um, you know, which is going to probably have an effect on the value of people's financial assets and is going to make it harder for small businesses and for families to borrow because interest rates will be, will be higher. But, um, look at the end of the day, it's not an either or situation, right? We cannot, we cannot allow a 1970s situation to develop where people just become accustomed to seven, eight, nine percent inflation every single year. So the Fed, the Fed's going to administer some pretty tough medicine, and and hopefully that'll uh, that'll squash inflation. And I'll just maybe tack on to that. Um, I come from a, a state that relies heavily on oil and gas. We 25 percent of Oklahoma state revenue is oil and gas driven. And you know, you will hear economists talk about the fact that when you when there's an increase in energy prices, that it impacts everything. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing. If you think back to the 2007-8 timeframe when gas prices were at you know four dollars plus a gallon, um, price of everything went up. And and I think that's you know one of the things that we're seeing right now. We need to be looking at how can we bring those energy prices back down because at the end of the day, when we're talking about um, inequities here. The increase in food, which we've seen, the increase in the cost of gasoline, the increase in um, home heating oil for many folks across the country um, is, is more of an impact on that bottom third, right? How do we try to find ways to um, you know, uh, mitigate the, the impact, which is because of, of the higher energy costs? I think there are a lot of things that we can be doing. Um, to, to, to mitigate that and to keep it from, from increasing. So we are uh, closing in on the top of the hour. Uh, I wanna finish with one question then ask for closing thoughts from our, our panelists. Uh, it was touched on earlier, the role that immigrants have played in starting businesses of all sizes and levels of success around the country. Is there an opportunity with the select committee to uh, look at immigration as a way to decrease economic disparity and uh, perhaps have some folks, folks like Hadi, for example, come and testify uh, to the committee. Um, yeah, un un unquestionably, the hesitation you hear in my voice is that you know you <laughs> you would you would you would want to bound the discussion, right? Um, uh, there is universal agreement around here in terms of the economic value of educated immigration. Um, uh, lots of people, particularly in my party, but in the other party as well, would also say, but that's not our only value, right? I mean, the words on the uh, Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, 
you know, suggests that our values commit us to bringing in people who don't necessarily have engineering <laughs> degrees, but who are being sort of shunned by um, by other countries. So, um, but no, I think um, I, I, I think it's it, it's a it's a really critical issue. And and again, if the committee can pull off a, a race hearing, and I don't think there are many topics harder to discuss in a constructive and graceful way than race, um, I have every confidence that we could have a good uh, a good discussion on on immigration as well. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Jim. The, the challenge is um, right now, particularly uh, in the environment that we're in, no one wants to even tackle small parts, right? So I have um, joined on to be part of the Temporary Family Visa Act, which Paya has been very supportive of, uh, to try to um, extend the time frame for visa um, and vigils looking for an extended visa. And, um, you know, we have a great bipartisan bill that we feel like has really good opportunities. But what I've heard as a freshman is, yeah, well, touching any part of immigration um, becomes challenging because a lot of people say, if we're gonna do immigration reform, it has to be a holistic package. It can't be just one little piece, right? Well, why not? I mean, let's, we talked about visas earlier. You know, I have, I come from a state that has a lot of agriculture. Why are we not looking at some extended seasonal visas to make it easier for folks to come work for the summer or the fall and then go back, right? We're making it more difficult. Um, and, I, and, and I've told this story many times over that my, um, my uncle was, uh, my uncle, I'm sorry, my cousin was brought here uh, by my father um, on a work visa and spent 10 years and um, $100,000 to become a citizen of this great country. Why? Why is it taking that long and that much money to become a citizen? These are the things that we really should be talking about. And I think we can and we should. Um, it's just a matter of um, who has the um, you know, fortitude to want to have those tough conversations. If, if you want to ask me to testify, I, I can't speak to most of immigration, but the part of immigration I know the most about is high-skilled immigration, uh, where certainly we're aware that the need for high-skilled immigration is much more than what the country allows, and there's an opportunity to raise the cap on how many high-skilled immigrants uh, could be led into the country. And the main objection to that is for people saying, why don't we have Americans fill those jobs? And the challenge in that part is really an education one. Uh, and there actually is a potential fix here that may not need touching the toxic, you know, entire nest of immigration as a whole is too toxic, I think, for Congress right now. But what thing most Congress people don't know is that we get hundreds of millions of dollars a year for high skilled immigrants as money that comes into the federal government. And it's supposed to then go into workforce programs to help fill those jobs. But the workforce programs are where that funding goes doesn't address the actual education needed, which is computer science education. It, the, you know, the money comes in to bring computer scientists into the country, and then the federal government spends it much more generically in a way that doesn't increase our homegrown talent. Uh, and so fixing how, where the money from H-1B visas goes is, a, is an actual opportunity without touching the rest of immigration, just making that money go directly to where the needs are. Hadi. Congresswoman Vice, Congressman Himes, uh, thank you for a fast-paced and thoughtful conversation on uh, truly pressing an American issue. It's nice to feel like despite all of our disparate backgrounds and our geographic locations, we're all pulling in the same direction here. And so I wish you all the best in the work of the committee and, and working uh, outside of the Beltway as well. I'll turn it back over to Morad to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Amir, for doing a great job as usual. Uh, Chairman Vice. Congresswoman, I mean, Chairman Himes, Congresswoman Bice, and Hobby. I like the way that sounded, Norad. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years, a couple of years, she'll be there. <laughs> You'll get there. You'll get there. Um, thank you again. Uh, you know, I'm much more hopeful at five o'clock than I was at four o'clock on our country resolving some of these, you know, very challenging issues. So, uh, all three of you, thank you uh, for joining us and having this discussion with us for the participants. Um, you know, we hope to have more events like this in the future. Uh, if you're not on our newsletter list, please go to our website, uh, paaia.org, sign up uh, so you can learn more about, you know, some of the activities we're doing. Um, and uh, thank you again, everyone, uh, and wishing everyone the best evening and goodbye.